Hey, good day, good day, everybody. How you doing? Thank you for joining me. Just in case you're joining me for the very first time, I'm your host, The Real Brian Glitz Gibbs. This is my ministry. Make sure you hit the like button. Make sure you subscribe. Make sure you support. Like I said right now, is my objective is these are cautionary tales. These are used for educational purpose to stop our children, our grandchildren, the next generation, to stop them from making that multi-billion dollar prison system their permanent address. Crime doesn't pay. There's no shortcut in life. Only thing come fast, trouble. Listen, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a review. Shout out to this group. You know, right now, Wiz, it's a new YouTube channel app. And like I said right now, Wiz, you know, he's been out on Instagram for quite some time. And I heard he got a nice following on Twitter. But anyway, right now, it's called Valtown. Okay, and I'm going to put the link, you know what I'm saying, in this video. But Valtown, they say Fat Cat Nichols, Rich in the Hood. Season 1, Episode 1, Lorenzo Fat Cat Nichols, South Jamaica. So basically right now, he came out with like, you know, almost a 30-minute documentary on Lorenzo Fat Cat Nichols and the organization, and right now, Rich Porter. And like I told you, me, myself, this is what I put. Valtown, great story, great short story. Let's separate facts from fiction from me, the real Brian Glaze Gibbs. And right now, was what he did was he's speaking about certain things in there that, guess what, he got some of the facts but then some of the facts you don't have is fiction. So even with that being said, what I'm going to do is right now, I'm going to try to break it down to the best of my ability because he made a statement. And something that he said in regards to like when Lorenzo Fat Cat Nichols, parole officer, late Brian Rooney, was executed. And basically right now, what folks don't understand, he never sent out a hit team. What he wanted to do, and according to Fat Cat, he requested, look, intimidate him, rough him up. So he couldn't come to the hearing as far as right now. So if he don't come to the hearing, Cat was under impression, I guess, from his legal team that if he don't come to the hearing, guess what? They got to let Cat go. So that's what he's betting on. Because once again, this guy's worth a million and he's back cooped up in a jail damn cell when he's so used to being in a mansion, eating steak and lobster. You know what? Hey, doing what he want to do. Now his control is gone. He's back behind cage, like a cage animal, and he couldn't deal with it. So even with that being said right now is, my man came along and said, guess what? Fat Cat ordered a hit team to prove or, uh, you know, right now to flex his muscle, and he wanted them to be killed. And then he went on to say, that rough, pappy man, right-hand man, has something to do with it. That is not the case, folks. And right now is, I'm gonna play this part, and I'm gonna continue, and let you know exactly what took place. So right now, what he's about to say about Ruff is fiction. And Cat was just a worker. But the flashiness and showboating was what brought Cat unnecessary attention. With the help of an informant who used to work for Cat, Stoney Baskin, authorities were able to key in on the deli and create an indictment which would put Cat and whoever was in the deli away for a long time. On July 29th, 1985, at 10 p.m., the deli was raided, in which they found not only Fat Cat, but two men from his core team, Junkhead and Spoon. Police found a 9mm 18-shot automatic, a Steyr assault rifle, and two loaded automatic weapons. As for drugs and cash, they found $200,000 in cash and $500,000 worth of drugs. A crowd formed outside as everyone was being let out of the deli in cuffs. And Pappy was prepared to shoot the cops to free Cat. Until Cat waved them off and said no. Without making a single phone call, Cat's lawyer David Cohen showed up to the scene immediately. The police said to Newsday and New York Magazine that they never seen anything of that sort before. They were dealing with a real crime boss. All the men were sent to Queensboro Correctional Facility. Within 24 hours, Cat's crew were released on cash bonds, with his as being 70000 Although law enforcement knew who they were dealing with, they were ignorant as to know how much money he really made on the streets. As the weeks went on, Cat couldn't stay off his parole officer's radar. And two weeks after posting bail, Cat was right back in jail. This decision from Brian Rooney would be the start of the end in South Jamaica's streets. It was 1985, and Cat was furious that he got himself in his current predicament. He was still running things on the outside and had Pappy as the all-seeing eye on the streets. Cat wanted to prove a point to himself that no matter where he was, he will remain a force. 
So to act on that notion, he chose to put out a hit on Brian Rooney through Pappy, Jughead, and Mike Bones. On October 10th, 1985, Jughead got in contact with Perry Bellamy, an associate who at the time would be used as a fake informant to set up Brian Rooney. Perry and Jughead would meet up together on Sunset Boulevard and use a payphone to contact Brian Rooney. There was an arrangement for Brian to meet with Perry at 7 p.m. on 119th Avenue and 155th Street. And when Brian showed up for the meeting, he had no idea he was walking into a death trap. As Perry approached Brian, Ruff, who is Pappy Mason's enforcer, shot into the car. Brian was startled and tried to pull off, but it was too late. Pappy finished the job, and Brian Rooney was no more. Okay, so you heard it for yourself. Like, once again, that did not happen. That did not take place. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go step further, okay? And I'll tell you exactly what happened. Okay, now, from 1985, and this is a court document. This is a court document, so nobody can say, oh, well, you know, they, these guys already did time for it. From 1985, Lucas belonged to a drug game in Queens, New York, under the leadership of Lorenzo Fat Cat Nickers. Lucas' younger brother, Lamont Lucas, was also a gang member. Following Nichols' arrest for drug-related activity, Nickel Parole Officer Brian Rooney charged him with a parole violation. The gang then offered the Lucas brother the job of wounding, like wounding Officer Rooney, not killing him, wounding Officer Rooney in retaliation for the charge on October 10th, 1985. The gang superior, Fritz Jughead William and Joseph Bovo Roger, nothing about Pappy, put the brothers in the car with a gun with instruction to cause an accident with Officer Rooney's car and then shoot and pistol with Rooney when he emerged to inspect the damage. Concerning for their own safety while assaulting an armed parole officer, however, the Lucases resolved merely to shoot at Officer Rooney in his car as the two sped by him. Randolph Lucas fired two shots, both of which struck Officer Rooney, killing him. Nichols' criminal enterprise rewarded the Lucas brother with cash, payment, and control of a drug distribution location. So once again, like I said right now, was according to them, according to Bowtown, they said right now, Ruff. Ruff was not a hitter. Ruff didn't have Ruff was nowhere around. Ruff wasn't a part of that. So like I said right now, was that what you say Ruff did it was fiction. Hey, the real Brian Glaze Gibbs, you know what? doing a review on Bowtown, the Fat Cat Nickel series, Rich in the Hood, season one, episode one, Lorenzo Fat Cat Nickel, South Jamaica, Queens. And as I say, this is a great story, a great short story. But like I say, let's separate fiction for fact. So here it is right now is even in this documentary, what he's saying is this, as far as who is cat people, who is cat crew. And a lot of times right now, folks, listen, People like to talk about the round table. Who was a part of the round table? Who wasn't a part of the round table? And right now, like I said right now, a lot of people that basically say that they was a part of it, wasn't a part of it. And to me, like right now, was guess what? Even some of the names, they was not a part of it. Okay? Right now was guess what? Probably the talk was out there before my time. But when everything actually went into place, when Lorenzo Fat Cat Nichols put the round table in place right now is guess what? These are the key player that what he did was he issued all gold and diamond round table rings. So to me right now, none of these other individuals that in this documentary right now for Bowtown was mentioned. So once again, like I said right now is what I want you to do is I want you to take it upon yourself. And to me right now is I'm going to let you listen to what was said. And then right now I'm going to come back and I'm explain to you exactly each and every individual that was part of the round table. Like I said right now, you got all these people that's out there. They was in these guys ear. Yo, I was part of the round table. I was this, I was that. You know what? Like I told you right now, guess what? That was not the case. So right now what I want you to do, listen to it for yourself and I'm explain to you. And it's record. It's not something I'm making up or whatever. I don't got to toot my own horn or whatever. But I'm going to tell you exactly all the players that was part of the round table, the original round table. Showing no mercy and enforcing the rules. Drug addicts who filled the streets were down with gasoline and lit on fire. If dealers stole from them, they were either beat down or tortured. 
Any money stolen, a thousand dollars or more equal death. Cat's core crew was Chris Jughead Williams, Joseph Bogle Rogers, and Luke Spoon Stephen. By 1985, Fat Cat's organization brought in over $100 million in drug money. And Cat, at this point, faded to the background and was rarely seen. He controlled his operation from the dark, and orders were carried out swiftly. Cat opened a deli on 150th Street and 107th Avenue that served as a front for his drug operation. He named the establishment Big Mac's Deli. Cat was so respected, his store was the only business on the block that didn't have any bars protecting the windows. Folks in the neighborhood feared Cat, and he moved how he wanted. The deli was known as the game room to the locals and members of the crew. Fat Cat had set up the round table, which featured Queen's most powerful kingpins. The Corley brothers, Ken of Supreme McGriff, Fat Cat himself, Spoon, the first Wilder brothers, and Tommy Montana Mickens. Queens was divided up amongst these men, and this helped diffuse problems that could come up due to territory. By summer 1985, word of Fat Cat seemingly meant Hey, so even right now, as you listen to him, and according to the documentary, this is fiction. He said right now, part of, and I'm saying a round table, he may mention of some of these individuals. He may mention of the Corleys. The Corleys and Cat was not, like I said right now, they dealt with each other and they came to an understanding. But no, the Corley was not a part of the round table. They mentioned Tommy Mickens. Tommy Mickens was in his own little private world. So once again, here it is right now, him and Cat. You know I'm saying Tommy Macon was not part of the round table. Um, they may mention, like I said right now, the Furtado brothers. Like I say, despite their strong relationship, guess what? The Furtado brothers was not part of the round table. So right now is these are the individuals that was part of the round table. Lorenzo Fat Cat Nichols, Howard Pappy Mason, Kenneth Supreme McGriff. Gerald Prince Miller, Emery Bugout Matthew, and Brian Glaze Gibbs. Those was part of the round table that Cat put together. So any other name right now is, it wasn't so. It didn't happen. Each and every one of us right now represented, you know, saying and had as far as the pinky, gold, and diamond round table ring issued by Lorenzo Fat Cat Nichols. So once again, you know what I'm saying? Bowtown, wherever you got your information in regards to that, that was fiction. That was not facts. Okay, another fiction in the Bowtown documentary. Basically what he was saying is this, in regards to the Maisha situation. Maisha was one of Cat many girlfriends. And right now is, here it is, He's, she's supposed to be his youngest son, you know what I'm saying, baby mother. So once again, even in this documentary, my man is saying that Cat put a hit out on Maisha. Okay, that is facts. But then again, right now is what he's trying to say is this, that I was there. And basically right now is like, they, they, I took the kid out the car and let the kid wander in the street. That is fiction. And basically say they was in the car. And, you know, here it is. People start shooting at the car, killing them. That was fiction. So once again, like I said right now is when everything took place. Yes, I did. Took the kid out the car. Yes, I did. Put the kid in a secure yard. And yes, I did. Call. I'm saying the number that I had called many times before. And when my Isha mother answered the phone, I stated, listen, here it is. It's a child in the yard. Please get that child. So the kid, you know what I'm saying, wasn't wanted off in the street like they say that was forced. So once again, what I want you to do, I want you to hear it for yourself and you determine. But like I said right now, Wiz, that was fiction. His men were murdering witnesses and potential ones, creating deeper problems for law enforcement. Out of the many witnesses who were taken out, the one most personal to him was his son's mother, 
Myrtle Horsham. Myrtle was known as Misha in the streets of Queens and became a threat to Cat after she became disgruntled with him. Misha was one of his many girlfriends, but was his favorite. Cat was a grown man. Messed with Maisha. So the difference is when he met Maisha, Maisha was what, 17? Cat got sick and tired, sick and tired, sick and tired of Maisha and Maisha behavior. And I think several times, Maisha threatened him. Maisha threatened Cat. So as time went on, you know, and Maisha and Cat relationship was strained, Cat say, you know what, it's in work, she gotta go. He wanted to go. He was trying to call himself tying up all loose ends. While this was going on, Fat Cat's wife Joanne, known as Mouse, was living in a big house in Elmont, Long Island. Misha and her friend were cruising through the 40 projects one evening, and they were cornered by two of Cat's men on a one-way street. They used his tactics to keep the women hostage. One of Cat's men took his 18-month-old son out the car, placed him on the sidewalk, and both men began to shoot at the vehicle, killing Misha and wounding her friend. Fat Cat's son was found wandering on the sidewalk. One of those men is Brian Glaze Gibbs, a notorious enforcer from East New York, Brooklyn, who found his way in Queens during the 80s by way of his connections in the streets. The increased violence because of the new young dealers and Cat being behind bars created a target on his back to be put away for a long time. This was a battle that he was losing. Queens District Attorney John Santucci was quoted saying, Nichols is one of the major drug dealers in all of New York City. His operation netted millions of dollars annually and extended beyond Queens into Brooklyn and Nassau County. As this was going on, it became inevitable that Cat would spend at least 20 years in prison. On January 8, 1988, Cat was sentenced to 25 years in prison on the charges of six counts of criminal possession of a weapon and three counts of criminal possession of a controlled substance. The headline read, Nichols is convicted on drug charges. As the judge read the verdict, one of the attending cops yelled out, the cat's nine lives are over. Nobody takes an order from a lifer. Cat still had to go on trial for the 1985 Brian Rooney murder, which came with another life sentence. For everyone Cat had killed, he took personal losses of his own. His mother's house in Queens was burned down, which resulted in the death of his sister, who was confined to a wheelchair and had no way of getting out the house. Cat's wife, Mouse, was kidnapped by four men who claimed to be police officers investigating Brian Rooney's murder. They were found to be imposters and were brought to trial and sentenced. Pappy, on the other hand, because of his actions against Perry Bellamy, Perry was unwilling to testify. Only hey. the confession was played. So even with that being said, like I said right now, yeah, it is facts that, you know, his wife was kidnapped. You know I'm saying off the street, people posing as police officer. Right now, I'm going to put the link. I did a piece on that on my platform. And also right now, it's true that they did throw a firebomb through his mother house. OK, I did a few pieces about that. So that is facts or whatever. But like I told you right now, it's a lot of stuff right now, you know, okay, cool. Like, you know, it's facts. And there's a lot of stuff in there that's fiction. And like I said right now, the bottom line is this, honestly speaking, folks, utilize these stories as cautionary tale. Utilize these stories as educational purpose. Let these kids know right now where it's like, you got a person like a King Allah. You want to take shortcut. Didn't want to go out there and get a job. So you got a lot of people like, you know, myself, Fat Cat, you know, Pappy Mason. You know what? We we didn't want to get a job. So we's out there committing crime. And you know what? That's the worst thing you could have done. Like I said, well, your crime doesn't pay. There's no shortcut in life. And right now is guess what? Utilize these stories as cautionary tale to stop our children from making that multi-billion dollar prison system their permanent address for life. To stop our children from going to that graveyard of a violent death at an early age. Listen, folks, hit the like button, subscribe, share, support, and shout out to Vow Time. You know what I'm saying? The Vow Time, you know what I'm saying? Documentary. Check out their channel. The link is in my description box. Peace, love, and prosperity. Brian Glaze Gibbs, the real Brian Glaze Gibbs. One love.